Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this worship broadcast of Cross Life Church. I'm Darren, the pastor at Cross Life Church, and it's so good to have you here this morning. A special welcome to our guests who are with us today. If you've not joined us before, we're so glad to have you. And we are continuing a series today called Chase the Lion. We have a Facebook check-in that you can post any time during the broadcast today that encapsulates what we're studying today and lets others know that you're in word and worship. We also have a QR code right here. And if you scan that QR code, you can do it right now or any other time that this comes up during the broadcast. That takes you to a prayer request form. And we have a prayer team here at Cross Life Church. We've received your prayers. Thank you so much for sending them. And we love praying for anything in your life and your world, big or small. If you need any help, if you're wondering about anything, just, just scan this. As a matter of fact, maybe scan it right now, even if you don't think you'll need it. And that way it's on your phone. And during the message, during worship, as God might move you to need prayer, and then you can submit that form. So right there, there it is. All right, we have uh, an exciting Sunday planned at Cross Life next Sunday, November 6th. And that's our celebration of Ministry Sunday. Uh, we recognize and we praise God for our new teachers at our school and also our new leaders at church. We will feature some of them, we'll highlight them, thank God for them, and also, just as exciting, we are going to have a potluck dinner after the service. So uh, bring something to share and be here in person on Sunday, November 6th. Let's get going with our worship by singing a song about how many reasons do we have to praise God and thank him for his blessings for this day, for our Savior G Jesus? At least one or two, if not 10,000 reasons. Please join to sing. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The song. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Ten thousand years. 
present and forevermore. Forevermore. So, so long. How much would it cost for you if you were to pay God and to make up for all your sins? I mean, have you ever tried that? Actually, all of us have. We've, we've tried to pay God for our sins by maybe trying harder or doing better or reminding God that we've never stolen a Chick-fil-A sandwich from a homeless person. <laughs> we've, we, we've tried to act as if we could pay our way for our sins. And I have some news for you. The Bible says that that's impossible. We can never, ever pay enough. We can never, ever do enough to make up for our sins. You now, it was in the early 1500s that a priest, a professor, and a, a prolific speaker and writer in the church, his name was Martin Luther, spoke against something called indulgences. And these were certificates. They were sold by the Pope and by the church claiming that people could pay for sins, that they could buy forgiveness from God and eternal life with God. So what Martin Luther did is he wrote 95 statements or theses against this practice. 95 of them. Here's number 21. Luther writes, indulgence preachers are in error saying that a person is absolved, forgiven, from every penalty and saved by papal indulgences. I have some good news. You are right with God, saved from your sins, and assured of forgiveness and eternal life in heaven. Why? Because of the Bible's truth alone, the teaching of, of the grace of Jesus Christ alone, and for you receiving that as a gift by faith alone and not by good deeds. That's why Martin Luther wrote this thesis number 36. Any truly repentant Christian has a right to full remission of penalty and guilt, full remission, that means forgiveness, even without indulgence letters. You don't need to pay for your sins. You can't. So believe in Jesus Christ for your salvation. Repent, that means confess your sins, your unworthiness to God. He's waiting for you to confess that and then trust in his faithful, forgiving love. God can save you even though you can't. God can deliver you. So pray to him this word of prayer from Psalm 31, verse 5. God, into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, my faithful God. Amen. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place, oh, I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. The truth, the lie, I believe through every blessing, through every promise, through every
Hey, kids, question for you. How many of you have ever ridden in the car? Raise your hand if you've ridden in the car. Okay, I have ridden in the car too. And so let's imagine that we're actually driving the car. You're not old enough to drive yet. We're just pretending. But here's the, here's the car seat. You open the door and you get in the car and you close the door. What's the first thing that you do after you get in the car? Start the car. No, mm -mm. before you start the car, what do you do? You do this to be safe. You do this in case you get in an accident. It'll help you keep safe. You buckle your seatbelt. You bring the seatbelt over. You click it. And now you're safe to drive. Now, you do that maybe in a car seat or maybe in the back seat. Mom or dad do it in the front seat. We put our seatbelt on for safety. How often do you do that? How many times when you drive or you ride in the car, do you put your seatbelt on? Every time. How many times have you needed it? Maybe never. Maybe you've never been in an accident in your car. I hope so. Maybe you have been in an accident and it saved you. But you want to put your seatbelt on every time 
just in case. You know, your seatbelt is like Jesus. The seatbelt saves you, it protects you. How often do you want to put Jesus on? How often do you want to wear Jesus like you wear a seatbelt? Every time, all the time. The Bible has a verse that tells us to do that. That verse says, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Meaning every time you think, every time you're thinking something, it's like putting Jesus on, putting a seatbelt on. You're thinking of Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we want to think of you all the time, just like we put our seatbelt on all the time. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, we'd love for you to do a Facebook check-in. You can also scan a QR code that will be on the screen for online giving. If our broadcasts have been meaningful to you in any way, if you've shared them with a friend and they've inspired your friend and you see them working, we would love for your help to make sure that these broadcasts go to as many people as possible and that we can continue our mission here at Cross Life Church. So scan that QR code that'll be on the screen and you can give to us online. We appreciate your support and thank you for that gift. After that, I'll come back and I'll preach today's message. So they say that a picture is worth a thousand words, but I want you to do some math with me, okay? So the, the human brain can process data on a page, like print on a page, at 100 bits per second. But the human brain can process a picture on a page at 1 billion bits per second. So if I'm doing the math right, that means that Actually, a picture is worth 10 million words. <laughs> like, I'm going to show you this picture here. This is a picture of uh, some of our kids during our Cross Kids Children's Ministry. As you're looking at this picture of our, of our Sunday Children's Ministry, see there's just these billion bits of data, now actually more, every second, are processing in our brains right now as we're thinking about, you know, what's making these girls so happy? And uh, look what Juliet is drawing. And, uh, oh, Ada has something in her hands. And are, are those boys being naughty that they're at a different table? And billions and billions more of data. There's so much of a story behind one captured moment. So, here we are in our Chase the Lion series. And we focused on the impact of one moment. Right, two Sundays ago, we looked at the impact of, of not turning around and fleeing from the lion, from what you fear, but taking God-honoring risks in faith and approaching our fears because God is good all the time, because we believe in God and his promises and, his, and we know him in his power, he'll show up. Last Sunday, we looked at the impact 
of the ripple effect of making a, a splash, big splash or a small splash, but whatever that splash is, in that moment then that releases ripples and the impact and influence that goes out as it, it uh, influences other people's lives with God's love and kindness and strength and power. Today, we're also looking at what a moment looks like, but what we're actually doing is, is we're getting behind that moment. And, and we're looking, like looking at a picture, there's billions of stories behind that picture. There's 10 million words. So we're, gonna, we're going to look behind a particular moment that comes up here in 2 Samuel 23 with one of David's fighting men. And uh, we're, we're going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate the moments of our lives just like this moment in the Bible we're going to look at, and how God is behind every single moment with a billion other moments in his faithfulness, in his forgiveness, being God with the power of his promises and the saving grace of Jesus Christ, and how behind the moment, God is faithful. Now, part of that celebration of, uh, of our series today is another celebration that we're weaving into the scriptures today and our worship, and that celebration is a celebration of the Lutheran Reformation. That was a religious movement that took place about 500 years ago, and it was ignited by a priest and a professor, prolific writer and speaker named Martin Luther. And uh, we're going to look at that, that Lutheran Reformation today and one of the big picture moments in Martin Luther's life was when he took a stand at the Diet of Worms. It, it, it looks like worms, but it's said Worms in Germany. And a diet is a meeting. And so Luther was called to this meeting, and he took a stand for the truths of the Bible. Now, he, he, he was put on trial almost for, for the, the books that he had written. And, and this big story behind that big picture moment when he was asked to take it back I'm going to tell you a little, few more details in a minute. But the big story behind it was that Luther had written thousands of words defending the Bible as the absolute truth of God and higher authority than man-made rules and traditions, even those of the church and the Pope. The Bible trumps them all. And Luther had written that sinners are forgiven and saved alone by the grace of Jesus Christ, and a person's own faith receives the free gifts of of salvation and other blessings of God without needing to accumulate any kind of credit or righteousness by a person's own good deeds. And now that all resulted in this one big moment in, in Martin Luther's life and his story that, that God had orchestrated and, and uh, planned behind this moment in all kinds of little details. And so we look at all these pixelations of God's doing and God's work in Martin Luther's life story up to this moment. I'm going to list 10 of them here. And we're going to go all the way back to the beginning, okay? Follow along, maybe take some notes. Here we go, number one. Martin Luther was born on November 10th, 1483 in Eisleben, Germany to Hans und Margaret Luther. And he was actually baptized the next day. Number two, a few years later, Martin Luther went to school where religion held a prominent place in his schooling and he learned doctrine and he, and he learned hymns and prayers. He spoke Latin. Uh, the teachers were harsh and he was once whipped 15 times for, for failing to provide a lesson that wasn't even assigned to him. And that experience God used because it helped Luther develop his love for God's forgiving grace and how important it is for the church to proclaim that forgiving grace. Three, Luther became an exceptional student. He earned his master's degree from the University of Erfurt. And number four, while a student there, Luther discovered something that was actually kept quite hidden in those days. And you might find this surprising. He discovered a book, and that book was a book that was typically held very tightly by the priests in the church. And, and Martin Luther had only heard it read in the church. He had never actually touched one until now. It was chained in place in the university library. You know what that book was? That book was the Bible. All right, five. Uh, Martin Luther's father wanted him to become a lawyer, but, but Luther's heart was heavy. He didn't want to study law. He wanted to study more about God, and yet 
because of his upbringing, the way that religion was brought to him, he was afraid of God. That's how we saw God, as someone to be afraid of. So he was caught up in this violent storm, and lightning struck nearby, and he fell to the ground, and he prayed, save me, and I'll become a monk. And uh, he survived, and so he did. He became a monk. And then as a monk, the more he studied the Bible, number six, the more he, was, he still was not at peace. He just realized he couldn't do enough to be saved, that he wasn't good enough to earn God's goodness. There is a a man, a leader at the monastery named Dr. John Stalpitz, and he told Luther, throw yourselves, throw yourself into Jesus' arms. Believe in him. And so that's what Martin Luther did. Number seven, um, Luther rose to leadership in the monastery, and uh, he became a doctor of theology, and uh, then he began lecturing at the university. And again, now, the more he studied his Bible, Now he's starting to realize that he didn't need good deeds to be forgiven. He didn't need the church to interpret the Bible as the only ones who could interpret it. He didn't need uh, these certificates called indulgences to provide eternal peace after death. He just needed Jesus. So on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed what we know as his 95 theses or statements to the wooden church door in Wittenberg, Germany. He was disagreeing with the church's teachings. He was publicly asking church leaders and even the Pope to correctly teach the Bible in Jesus. Yeah, they didn't like that, and eventually Martin Luther was excommunicated and condemned as a heretic. But Martin Luther's friend, Elector Frederick the Wise, defended him and made arrangements for Luther to be heard before powerful leaders of the church and even the Roman Empire itself, including Emperor Charles V, and this was at the Diet of Worms, Worms, it looks like. And there he, Luther was asked, he was asked to retract his writings. Luther, uh, Luther refused, and here's what he said. <clears throat> he said, number 10, unless I am convinced by the testimonies of the Holy Scriptures or evident reason, I am neither able nor willing to recant. Here I stand God help me. Amen. That was a decisive moment for Martin Luther. That's what we're talking about in the Chase the Lion series, these moments where we don't run away, where we face our fears, where we're willing to battle. And Martin Luther stood his ground like another man in the Bible in 2 Samuel chapter 23. And that man's name is Eliezer. And uh, let me read here about Eliezer. 2 Samuel 23, verse 10. Eliezer stood his ground and struck down the Philistines, those are the enemies of his army, struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. Whoa, what do you see? Here's a picture moment. So what are you seeing in the billions of of bits of data in this picture that the Bible gives to us of Eliezer. I see many enemies, but I see one man, one day, one sword, one Lord God, and one great victory. Why? Because Eliezer's swing of the sword was so strong like Aragorn in Lord of the Rings? No. Look at this. Look what it said. His hand grew tired and froze to the sword. I see two vivid truths in that picture that the Bible is giving to us. His his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. Truth number one, he was ready to give up. I mean, he he had what it takes to maybe fight a few guys, but, but not a furious group of fighting men. And so his hand grew tired he just, he couldn't do it anymore. He was, he had to be thinking to himself, is this worth it? Am I going to die? I don't know what to do. He grew tired. That's what happens when we fight our battles. We grow tired. Even Jesus grew tired. But second vivid truth, he, he, he couldn't do it on his own, but second truth is he wouldn't give up. His hand, the Bible says, froze to the sword. He wouldn't let go of his grip on that sword. As tired as he was, as perhaps even fearful as he was, as hopeless as things became, he would not let go of his grip on the sword because he knew that that 
he was not only holding the sword, but he was holding his Lord. He was gripping onto his Lord. And the reason that he knew that is because he knew that his Lord was gripping onto him. And he won the victory. It says here, he won the victory. The Lord brought about a great victory that day, a decisive moment, a victory won. Now, when did Eliezer win the victory? He actually won that victory before he won the victory. And let me explain. Here's what the Bible says. As one of the three mighty warriors, he, Eliezer, was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Pastamim for battle. Then the Israelites retreated. Okay, now listen to this. You don't hit a Grand Slam in the World Series without doing what? Without thousands and thousands and thousands of swings before that in batting practice, learning how to hit a fastball. And you don't hit a Grand Slam in the, in the World Series without striking out at other times when you're at the plate, even in the World Series, even in that game. So Eliezer learned to not give up. He learned about the strong hand of the Lord God, and little by little he learned this over time with lots of practice, some trial and error, and then striking down these enemies. Man, that had to be one of the greatest days of Eliezer's life, but, but the day he won that victory, you know, wasn't the day he won the victory. He won the victory the day before, and the day before that, and the day before that. Eliezer learned about fighting and victory because Look at what this verse says here. He was with David. And David knew more than his fair share about fighting and victory. David also knew about retreating. He knew about, about failure, or at least in, in the human eyes, failure, but that's not always failure with God. And more than that, uh, Eliezer learned from David about the strength and the faithfulness of God. God is faithful. You know, in this series, we've seen that Benaiah jumped into a lion pit because God is faithful. Last Sunday, we looked at uh, Josheb and saw that he fought 800 men with one spear in one encounter because God is faithful. And we're talking about David here. And uh, early in his career, even after he was anointed king, but King Saul was still king, wicked King Saul, David would was encouraged by some of his followers and some in the kingdom to get rid of Saul. Saul was wicked. Saul was trying to kill David. And David did not go after Saul. David fled. He didn't fight him. He fled. He didn't assassinate Saul because David knew God is faithful. David could kill Goliath not because he was so skilled, but because he knew God is faithful. That's the story of Eliezer it's the story of Martin Luther. Martin Luther stood for these Bible truths right here and stood up for the gift of salvation because God is faithful. You know, sometimes when we, um, when we don't take action, we forfeit a victory that God truly wants to be ours, but it isn't because we're not faithful. Sometimes we wait on God, and we wait on God, and we wait on God, and while we're waiting, we get distracted and we chase other things. All the while, God was really waiting on us to take action. And sometimes we grow tired in the battle. We grow tired of, of being Christ followers. We grow tired of, of having to to put on a smile and, and be positive and hope-filled and filled with faith, and we just grow, grow tired and we grow weary and we, and we give up. And that's all, that's all being unfaithful. You know, for nearly 100 years, the Eastman Kodak Company, you recognize the name Kodak? It has to do with cameras and pictures. They, they, uh, they just dominated the world of cameras and pictures. And in 1975, a group of technicians from the Kodak Company actually came up with the first digital camera. What happened was that executives at the Kodak Company 
had this decisive moment, and here's what they decided. They decided not to do anything different. They decided that they would continue to market Kodak cameras and pictures with printed photographs. Now, how do you think that decision went? <laughs> well, raise your hand if the last 10 pictures you took, you used your phone or a digital camera. <laughs> That's all of us. So Eastman Kodak fell to the ground with a big thud. They uh, actually declared bankruptcy in 2012. Now, decisive moment, they, they didn't have what it takes. You and I haven't had what it takes in our decisive moments either, but here's the good news from the Bible today, that our decisive moments, whether we, whether we win or lose by our own decisions, God has won them already, but all kinds of other little moments that he, he pixelates in the pictures of our lives and in the story of our lives. Uh, he does so many things. He's so faithful in all his promises. So that's what I want to talk about um, for the remainder, the final part of the sermon here, that God never gets tired, he never gets distracted, he never loses, and he's never unfaithful. Um, do you know when you're, when you're playing a game of chess and you're moving these pieces around, during the first 10 moves of a chess game, how many different possibilities are there for how many different moves there p could potentially be? Here's the number. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. Here it is. You looking at it? I'm not even going to try to say that number. It's way billion, trillion, gazillion. It's just there's such a great range of possibilities. And you know what? the game of life is even more complicated than a game of chess. So what if you get it wrong? What if you miss the moment? I have three words for you. Listen carefully and look at your screen. Here's the words. God is faithful. You can shine in the moment because of all the billions of little moments, all the right moves of God in your life until and including that moment. The Bible talks about God's involvement in the lives of people that he loves, God's chess moves. And, and the Bible says in Acts chapter 17, God did this so that they, these people, would seek him, would seek God, and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. God is here. Live in him. Follow God's moves. God has been faithful through every one of your footsteps. God has been there in every traffic intersection you cross. God has watched every career, career course adjustment. And God has his eye on every bill you pay. He's making chess moves. Chess moves. Reaching out to you so that you reach out to him, says in Acts 17. And here's two of God's biggest moves. Jesus Christ, God's Son, moved with the cross on his shoulder, and he moved through the streets of Jerusalem, and he carried that cross up to a hill called Calvary. And there Jesus died on the cross, the biggest move in the history of forgiveness and grace of God. And he paid the price for all your sin, all of our unfaithfulness. He paid for it there on the cross. That was God's big move to save you. Then three days later, Jesus sent his, commanded his angels to move the stone away from Jesus' tomb, to roll the stone away, because Jesus had moved out of the tomb already, and he had risen from the dead, and he had made a move to take the throne of authority and power over the entire universe. And now Jesus continues his moves as he marches with the church on our mission. And before he left this world, he raised his hands in blessing and he gave us a promise and he said, I am with you always. So stand strong. Stand strong in your moment. It may not have gone the way you wanted it before. It may be tough. You, you may be tired and ready to give up. You may be growing weary. Stand strong like Martin Luther, like Eliezer. Jesus has died. Jesus has risen to life. Jesus is strong. Jesus stands alive. Jesus 
securely, holds you in his strong grip. Jesus has forgiven every one of your sins, and now Jesus works slowly, bit by bit, moment by moment, but strongly, so that you can win the day in your moment. Amen. Let's pray. God, what a great moment this was in the life and the career of Eliezer, how that day had to just live on as a legend when he was able to defeat so many enemies, when his, when his hand grew tired and yet froze to the sword. God, may that scripture find its way into the lives and the hearts and the faith of those who are watching here today in worship, those who are who are watching this sermon message, God, I pray for them. I know, God, that someone watching here today has grown weary. I know that someone watching this sermon message ha- is getting tired. I know that someone is looking for help. I know that someone perhaps doesn't yet even believe in Jesus, and God, I ask, fight for them. Jesus, stand strong in their place. Grab onto them much more strongly than they can grab onto you, God. And then make all these little pixelating moments behind the pictures of our lives, God. Make them come true for your glory, even as you do for our good. Thank you for this word of scripture today. May it inspire us, give us faith, give us hope. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. These are powerful truths of God that it's great to be reminded of, like I was just talking about Jesus crucifixion and resurrection, we like to review the truths of God's saving work in what we call creeds or statements of faith. And we like to connect ourselves to the history of believers centuries ago by saying the very words that they believed that they even wrote. And so I invite you to share with me today and speak aloud wherever you are these words of our statement of faith called the Apostles' Creed. Join with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join to sing our final song, Jesus Paid It All. I hear the Savior say strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all cause Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain
Thank you so much for being part of our worship today at Cross Life Church. We appreciate you joining us and invite you to join us again next week for our Celebration of Ministry Sunday and as we continue the Chase the Lion series. If you live in the immediate area, come on by in person and enjoy a Sunday in person here at Cross Life Church. God's blessings to you as you chase your lions. <laughs>